Now I would like to welcome our second speaker of the night, Dr. Chris Hewer. He comes from a background in Christian theology, education, Islamic studies and interfaith studies. He was the advisor on interfaith relations to the Bishop of Birmingham from the year 1999 to 2005. In 2006, he wrote a book about understanding Islam, where he explains how Muslims think and see the world around them. Dr. Chris Hewer has also given many speeches on a variety of Islamic topics which can be found on Ahlul Bayt TV and alislam.org. Without further ado, I would like to invite Dr. Chris Hewer to the stage. Let me just begin before I start to speak by commenting on the wonderful poetry that we have heard this evening. I'm very pleased to uh, be invited to speak to the uh, Tenth Day community because what you are doing is trying to take the message of Imam Hussein into the wider community of humanity. And that's what I want to look at and think about this evening. And I want to put a proposal before you. I want to take three steps before I get there, and then a few steps afterwards. The first step is this, that one of the most profound things that the Quran and the Prophet do in the life of Arabia is to demolish the idea of tribalism, to demolish this kind of separatism that tries to divide one group against another. And instead, the emphasis is on the oneness of humanity. Second point, the Quran never says of itself, this is guidance for a tribe of people called Muslims. It says of itself, this is guidance for all humankind. And therefore, its message must be opened out and made accessible to all humankind. Thirdly, the Quran does not say of the Prophet that he is a blessing for a tribe of people called Muslims. Indeed, it says of him that he is a blessing for all the worlds. His perfection lies in his humanity. Now, let me then put my proposition to you. My proposition is that all our great religious leaders do not belong to any particular faith community. Instead, they belong to God. Because they belong to God, they belong to all humankind. And we must therefore take their message and to make it accessible to all humankind. By that I mean that we must speak about it, we must explain it in a way that touches the humanity of those people who share a common humanity with us. So we should not be trying to portray it as though it were some kind of tribal activity amongst the Muslim tribe, but rather this is humanity and this is a message for humanity. So let me give one or two examples, or maybe even seven, uh, from the way in which I think that message needs to be presented to wider humanity. First of all, the essential action of Imam Hussein is to stand for justice and to stand against tyranny. Now, injustice is around us all the time in all sorts of different ways. So wherever we find injustice, there we find the need to speak the word of truth to take a stand in the same way that Imam Hussein does. We need to oppose tyranny, and it can be in small ways, and not just in great ways like a nation. The tyranny of an oppressive employer, the tyranny of those who would bully other people, 
And in this way, we are making that message relevant in every fiber of our lives. The consequence, why does Imam Hussein take a stand? Because the consequence would be that human life would sink into degeneracy. It would go down and down and down. He does not make a stand for the sake of his own prestige or position, but he makes a stand for the sake of Islam, of turning back to the principles of justice and equality and humanity and respect for all, because otherwise it was in danger of being lost and being depraved. Therefore, wherever there is injustice, we must take a stand. And I imagine fondly that Imam Hussein on his journey to Karbala was in his head all the time that hadith of the Prophet that says, the greatest jihad is to speak the word of truth into the face of the tyrant. What kind of depth of faith and of inner strength does that require? I am always impressed by the way we see it in the life of the Prophet, we see it in the life of Imam Ali, we see it also in the life of Imam Hassan, of Imam Hussein, the way in which they seek, if at all possible, to avoid conflict, to avoid the shedding of human blood. Let's talk, let's negotiate, let's go to arbitration, let's do anything, because every human life is infinitely precious. Now, we know if we look around the world today, we see that there is a rush to warfare, there is a rush to violence. There are people who would rather talk with guns than talk humanity one to another. And this is massively dangerous in our world because in this 21st century, for the first time in human history, we have such powerful weaponry that we can destroy a million in one go, that we can destroy life on earth. This is the great danger of not talking and not valuing the, infin the infinity of every human life. And we see it in the people trying to cross the channel, for goodness sake, if you really thought that they were human beings equal to you in every way, if you really thought that they were like your brothers in faith or your equals in humanity, would you be suggesting that we slash open the boats and turn them back? So let us return to humanity and to seeking to avoid conflict. The duty of leadership is one of the things that Imam Hussein profoundly represents in his story. Because the leader is the one who has not only to take a stand, but to be seen to take a stand. To be seen to be setting an example for others to follow. And I imagine Imam Hussein in Medina when he hears of Yazid and the agents of Yazid, and he is saying to himself, if I submit and give in this oath of allegiance, everyone else will think that they can too. And therefore it is the duty of a leader to lead by example and not just talk. Faith is never adequately expressed in words. It must always find that those words take root in actions in our society. The, the kind of examples that we saw there of actions of treating the humanity of people by feeding them, 
of reaching out to those in need in society. These actions speak of our faith. Not words, but actions. That is the message of Imam Hussein. I love the way in the poetry that reference was made to Hur. Hur is a profound example, but the way that Imam treats him is a profound example. Because not only does Hur come, as it were, to his senses, but what triggers that is the goodness of the way that Hussein treats him. He rides into the camp. Do you come as friend or foe? We do not come as friends. Give them our water. Break open the water. Make sure the horses have water. Sprinkle water over them. That's the way you treat other human beings. The goodness then starts to work in the heart of her. And so the story goes on, you know it well, until it comes to the very day of Ashura itself. And her comes to make his acknowledgement of his error before Imam Hussein. I am the one, I brought you to this place, I brought you to your death. Now, Imam Hussein does not say, yes you did, and here's a kick in the teeth to prove it. Instead, not only does he forgive him, but he raises him to the very highest to be able to give his life as a martyr fighting in the cause of Hussein. The forgiveness of God does not leave us crippled. It does not leave us unable to live the fullness of our humanity. The forgiveness of God is like raising Hur to the very highest level of becoming a martyr. There is a nonsense talked in our society and we must configure the way that we talk about the events leading up to Karbala and the events afterwards in order to point out that this lie has no place in Islam or in the message of the Muslim community. And that lie is that women are the weaker sex. Not only do the women of the company of Imam Hussein face all the deprivations and hardships of the desert, not only do they have to see to the children who have no water, who have no milk to drink for goodness sake, but they dress their men for battle, knowing that they go to death, and they receive back the mutilated bodies of the martyrs. There were eight mothers present in the camp of Hussein on the day of Ashura. They had no idea if they would live, if they would be violated, what would happen to them. Their faith and trust is equal to every man who gave his life on that day. And we know that after the event, the leader of the community is in fact Lady Zainab. Because Imam Zainal Abedin is weak and sick, and we know that even when they reach Damascus, he seeks her guidance before he gives an answer to the question. We know that she is the one who stands against the tyrant. We know that she is the one who throws herself over the Imam and says, if you're going to kill him, kill me first. And we think women are the weaker sex. Let me end by saying that part of the message of the story of Karbala is to say that God is able to take apparent defeat, a great sacrifice, the loss of life, a terrible tragedy, 
and to turn it into wonderful success, into wonderful, powerful message. Whoever today remembers the people of the Umayyad army who were standing there in their thousands, but millions across the world will know and venerate and take lessons from the martyrs of Karbala. So we must never feel, oh, we're only small, there's nothing we can do, it's a tragedy, it's not very good, because God takes all those tragedies and failures and sacrifices and mistakes and writes huge letters in the sky to inspire other human beings. And that is the message of Imam Hussein and the story of Karbala that we need to bring to people to touch their humanity so that we are true to call ourselves the lovers of Hussein. Thank you.